Welcome back to Chapter 6, Acellular Pathogens. Public health measures in the developed world have dramatically reduced mortality from viral epidemics. But when epidemics do occur, they can spread quickly uh, with global air travel. In 2009, an outbreak of H1N1 influenza, which is the predominant strain uh, right now in 2019, it spread across various continents. In early 2014, cases of Ebola in Guinea led to a massive epidemic in Western Africa. This included the case of an infected man who traveled to the United States, sparking fears the epidemic might spread beyond Africa. Until the late 1930s and the advent of the electron microscope, no one had seen a virus. Yet, treatments for preventing or curing viral infections were used and developed long before that. Historical records suggest that by the 17th century, and perhaps earlier, inoculation, also known as variolation, was being used to prevent the viral disease smallpox in various parts of the world. By the late 18th century, Englishman Edward Jenner was inoculating patients with cowpox to prevent smallpox, a technique he coined vaccination. Today, the structure and genetics of viruses are well defined, yet new discoveries continue to reveal their complexities. In this chapter, we will learn about the structure, classification, and cultivation of viruses, and how they impact their hosts. In addition, we will learn about other infective particles, such as viroids and prions. Section 6.1, Viruses. Learning Objectives. Describe the general characteristics of viruses as pathogens. Describe viral genomes. Describe the general characteristics of viral life cycles. Differentiate among bacteriophages, plant viruses, and animal viruses. Describe the characteristics used to identify viruses as obligate intracellular parasites. Despite their small size, which prevented them from being seen with light microscopes, the discovery of a filterable component smaller than a bacterium that causes tobacco mosaic disease, TMD, dates back to 1892. At that time, Dmitry Ivanovsky, a Russian botanist, discovered the source of TMD by using a porcelain filtering device first invented by Charles Chamberlain and Louis Pasteur in Paris in 1884. Porcelain Chamberlain filters have a pore size of 0.1 micrometers, which is small enough to remove all bacteria that are greater than or equal to about 0.2 micrometers from any liquids passed through the device. An extract obtained from TMD-infected tobacco plants was made to determine the cause of the disease. Initially, the source of the disease was thought to be bacterial. It was surprising to everyone when Ivanovsky using a Chamberlain filter, found that the cause of TMD was not removed after passing the extract through the porcelain filter. So if a bacterium was not the cause of TMD, what could be causing the disease? Ivanovsky concluded the cause of TMD must be an extremely small bacterium or bacterial spore. Other scientists, including Martinus Bjernik, continued investigating the cause of TMD. It was Bjernik in 1899, who eventually concluded that the causative agent was not a bacterium, but instead possibly a chemical, like a biological poison we would describe today as a toxin. As a result, the word virus, Latin for poison, poisonous slime, was used to describe the cause of TMD a few years after Ivanovsky's initial discovery. Even though he was not able to see the virus that caused TMD and did not realize the cause was not a bacterium, Ivanovsky is credited as the original discoverer of viruses and a founder of the field of virology. Today we can see viruses using electron microscopes and we know much more about them. Viruses are distinct biological entities, however their evolutionary origin is still a matter of speculation. In terms of taxonomy, they are not included in the tree of life because they are acellular. They don't consist of cells. In order to survive and reproduce, viruses must infect a cellular host, making them obligate intracellular parasites. The genome of a virus 
enters a host cell and directs the production of the viral components, proteins and nucleic acids needed to form new virus particles called virons. New virons are made in the host cell by assembly of viral components. The new virons transport the viral genome to another host cell to carry out another round of infection. Table 6.1 summarizes the properties of viruses. Infectious acellular pathogens, check. Obligate intracellular parasites with host and cell type specificity. DNA or RNA genome, never both. Uh, the genome is surrounded by a protein capsid and in some cases a phospholipid membrane studded with viral glycoproteins. Lack genes for many products needed for successful reproduction requiring exploitation of a host cell genomes to reproduce. Clinical focus, part one. David, a 45-year-old journalist, has just returned to the U.S. from travels in Russia, China, and Africa. He is not feeling well, so he goes to his general practitioner complaining of weakness in his arms and legs, fever, headache, noticeable agitation, and minor discomfort. He thinks it may be related to a dog bite he suffered while interviewing a Chinese farmer. He is experiencing some prickling and itching sensations at the site of the bite wound, but he tells the doctor that the dog seemed healthy and that he had not been concerned until now. The doctor ordered a culture and sensitivity test to rule out bacterial infection of the wound, and the results came back negative for any possible pathogenic bacteria. Based on this information, what additional tests should be performed on the patient? What type of treatment should the doctor recommend? More in part two. Hosts and viral transmission. Viruses can infect every type of host cell, including those of plants, animals, fungi, protists, bacteria, and archaea. Most viruses will only be able to infect the cells of one or a few species of organism. This is called the host range. However, having a wide host range is not common and viruses will typically only infect specific hosts and only specific cell types within those hosts. The viruses that infect bacteria are called bacteriophages, or simply phages. The word phage comes from the Greek word for devour. Other viruses are just identified by their host group, such as animals or plant viruses. Once a cell is infected, the effect of the virus can vary depending on the type of virus. Viruses may cause abnormal growth of the cell or cell death, alter the cell's genome, or cause little noticeable effect in the cell. Viruses can be transmitted through direct contact, indirect contact with fomites, or through a vector. Pictured here is um, an example of fomites. Fomites are non-living objects that can function to transfer a pathogen from one host to another. Doorknobs, you know, all these, anything you, you can handle, your phone. Okay, or through a vector, uh, an animal that transmits a pathogen from one host to another. Uh, arthropods, such as mosquitoes, ticks, fleas, uh, flies, are typical vectors for viral disease, and they may act as mechanical vectors or biological vectors. Mechanical transmission occurs when the arthropod carries a viral pathogen on the outside of its body and transmits it to a new host by physical contact. Like in this cartoon, we have the fly uh, functioning as a mechanical vector in that it's picking up a pathogen from the trash can there and it has now landed on your sandwich. Biological transmission occurs when the arthropod carries the viral pathogen inside its body and transmits it to the new host through biting. So plague, uh, which is caused by bacteria, malaria is a protozoan, uh, yellow fever, typhus fever, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, Chagas disease, Lyme disease, all these other diseases in which the pathogen is residing in the vector animal. In humans, a wide variety of viruses are capable of causing various infections and diseases. Some of the deadliest emerging pathogens in humans are viruses, yet we have few treatments or drugs to deal with viral infections, making them difficult to eradicate. Viruses that can be transmitted from an animal host to a human host 
can cause zoonosis. For example, the avian influenza virus originates in birds but causes disease in humans. Reverse zoonoses are caused by infection of an animal by a virus that originated in a human. Microconnections, fighting bacteria with viruses. The emergence of superbugs, or multidrug resistant bacteria, has become a major challenge for pharmaceutical companies and a serious health care problem. According to a 2013 report by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, more than 2 million people are infected with drug-resistant bacteria in the U.S. annually, resulting in 23,000 deaths. The continued use and overuse of antibiotics will likely lead to the evolution of even more drug-resistant strains. One potential solution is the use of phage therapy, a procedure that uses bacteria-killing viruses, bacteriophages, to treat bacterial infections. Phage therapy is not a new idea. The discovery of bacteriophages dates back to the early 20th century, and phage therapy was first used in Europe in 1915 by the English bacteriologist Frederick Twert. However, the subsequent discovery of penicillin and other antibiotics led to the near abandonment of this form of therapy, except in the former Soviet Union and a few countries in Eastern Europe. Interest in phage therapy outside of the countries of the former Soviet Union is only recently re-emerging because of the rise in antibiotic-resistant bacteria. Phage therapy has some advantages over antibiotics in that the phages kill only one specific bacterium, whereas antibiotics kill not only the pathogen, but also beneficial bacteria of the normal microbiota. Development of new antibiotics is also expensive for drug companies and for patients, especially for those who live in countries with high poverty rates. Phages have also been used to prevent food spoilage. In 2006, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration approved the use of a solution containing six bacteriophages that can be sprayed on lunch meats, such as bologna, ham, and turkey, to kill Listeria monocytogenes a bacterium responsible for listeriosis, a form of food poisoning. Some consumers have concerns about the use of phages on foods, however, especially given the rising popularity of organic products. Foods that have been treated with phages must declare bacteriophage preparation on, in the list of ingredients or include a label declaring that the meat has been treated with antimicrobial solution to reduce microorganisms. Okay, this isn't the place for me to editorialize. Moving on. Viral structures. In general, virons, viral particles, are small and cannot be observed using a regular light microscope. They are much smaller than prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. This is an adaptation allowing viruses to infect these larger cells. The size of a viron can range from 20 nanometers, wait, here, here we go, uh, for small viruses up to 900 nanometers for typical large viruses. Recent discoveries, however, have identified new giant viral species such as Pandora virus uh, salinus and Pithovirus sibiricum with sizes approaching that of a bacterial cell. In 1935, after the development of the electron microscope, Wendell Stanley was the first scientist to crystallize the structure of the tobacco mosaic virus and discovered that it is composed of RNA and protein. In 1943, he isolated influenza B virus, which contributed to the development of an influenza vaccine. Stanley's discoveries unlocked the mystery of the nature of viruses that had been puzzling scientists for over 40 years, and his contributions to the field of virology led to him being awarded the Nobel Prize in 1946. As a result of continuing research into the nature of viruses, we now know that they consist of a nucleic acid, either RNA or DNA, but never both, surrounded by a protein coat called a capsid, the interior of the capsid is not filled with cytosol, as in a cell, but instead it contains the bare necessities in terms of genome and enzymes needed to direct the synthesis of new virons. 
Each capsid is composed of protein subunits called capsomeres made of one or more different types of capsomere proteins that interlock to form the closely packed capsid. There are two categories of viruses based on general composition. Viruses formed from only a nucleic acid and capsid are called naked viruses or non-enveloped viruses. Viruses formed with a nucleic acid packed capsid surrounded by a lipid layer are called enveloped viruses. The viral envelope is a small portion of phospholipid membrane obtained as the viron buds from a host cell. The viral envelope may either be intracellular or cytoplasmic in origin. Extending outward and away from the capsid on some naked viruses and envelope viruses are protein structures called spikes. At the tips of these spikes are structures that allow the virus to attach and enter a cell, like the influenza virus hemagglutinin spikes or enzymes like the neuraminidase influenza virus spikes that allow the virus to detach from the cell surface during release of new virons. That's where we get the H and the N designation from the type of hemagglutinin and neuraminidase. Influenza viruses are often identified by their H and N spikes. For example, H1N1 influenza viruses were responsible for the pandemics in 1918 and 2009, H2N2 for the pandemic in 1957, and H3N2 for the pandemic in 1968. Viruses vary in the shape of their capsids, which can be either helical, polyhedral, or complex. A helical capsid forms the shape of the tobacco mosaic virus, TMV. A naked helical virus and Ebola virus, an enveloped helical virus. The capsid is cylindrical or rod-shaped, with the genome fitting just inside the length of the capsid. Polyhedral capsids form the shapes of poliovirus and rhinovirus and consist of a nucleic acid surrounded by a polyhedral capsid in the form of an icosahedron. An icosahedral capsid is a three-dimensional 20-sided structure with 12 vertices. These capsids somewhat resemble a soccer ball, more so a 20-sided die. Both helical and polyhedral viruses can have envelopes viral shapes seen in certain types of bacteriophages such as T4 phage and pox viruses like vaccinia virus may have features of both polyhedral and helical viruses so they are described as complex viral shapes. In the bacteriophage complex form the genome is located within the polyhedral head and the sheath connects the head to the tail fibers and tail pins that help the virus attach to receptors on the host cell's surface. Pox viruses that have complex shapes are often brick-shaped with intricate surface characteristics not seen in other categories of capsid. Classification and taxonomy of viruses. Although viruses are not classified in the three domains of life, their numbers are great enough to require classification. Since 1971, the International Union of Microbial Society's Virology Division has given the task of developing, refining, and maintaining a universal virus taxonomy to the International Committee on Taxonomy of Viruses, ICTV, as indicated, uh, it's not indicated here, perhaps usually it is indicated here, that's awkward. Since viruses can mutate so quickly, it can be difficult to classify them into a genus and a species epithet using the binomial nomenclature system. Thus, the ICTV's viral nomenclature system classifies viruses into families and genera based on viral genetics, chemistry, morphology, and mechanism of multiplication. To date, the ICTV has classified known viruses in seven orders 96 families and 350 genera. Viral families end in viridia, like parvoviridia, and genus names ending in virus, parvovirus. The names of viral orders, families, and genera are all italicized. When referring to a viral species, 
we often use a genus and species epithet such as Pandorovirus dulcis or Pandorovirus salinus. The Baltimore classification system is an alternative to ICTV nomenclature. The Baltimore system classifies viruses according to their genomes DNA or RNA, single versus double-stranded, and mode of replication. This system thus creates seven groups of viruses that have common genetics and biology. Aside from formal systems of nomenclature, viruses are often informally grouped into categories based on chemistry, morphology, or other characteristics they share in common. Categories may include naked or envelope structures, single-stranded or double-stranded DNA or single-stranded or double-stranded RNA genomes, segmented or non-segmented genomes, and a positive strand or negative strand RNA. For example, herpes virus can be classified as a DSDNA enveloped virus. Human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, is a plus single-stranded RNA enveloped virus and tobacco mosaic virus is a plus single-stranded RNA virus. Other characteristics such as host specificity, tissue specificity, capsid shape, and special genes or enzymes may also be used to describe groups of similar viruses. Here is a list of some of the most common viruses that are human pathogens by genome type. So we have our double-stranded enveloped that include our herpes viridia, an example being the simplex virus, and it fe results in clinical features that include cold sores, genital herpes, sexually transmitted disease. We have papillomavirus, so genital warts, cervical, vulvar, or vaginal cancer. Uh, Single-stranded DNA naked, they include respiratory tract infections, double-stranded RNA naked, include rotavirus, which causes gastroenteritis. We have a plus single-stranded RNA naked. That includes polio, hepatitis, uh, rhinovirus. And we have plus single-stranded RNA enveloped, which include uh, encephalitis, hemorrhagic fever, as well as rubella and AIDS. And then, of course, finally, the negative Single-stranded RNA enveloped virus families include Ebola virus, influenza, and rabies, the virus that causes rabies, uh, Lysa virus. So classification of viral diseases. While the ICTV has been tasked with the biological classification of viruses, it also played an important role in the classification of diseases caused by viruses. To facilitate the tracking of virus-related human diseases, the ICTV has created classifications that link to the International Classification of Diseases ICD, the standard taxonomy of disease that is maintained and updated by the World Health Organization. The ICD assigns an alphanumeric code of up to six characters for every type of viral infection, as well as all other types of disease, medical conditions, and causes of death. The ICD code is used in conjunction with two other coding systems, the Current Procedural Terminology and the Healthcare Common Procedure Coding System to categorize patient conditions for treatment and insurance reimbursement. For example, when a patient seeks treatment for a viral infection, ICD codes are routinely used by clinicians to order laboratory tests and prescribe treatments specific to the virus suspected of causing the illness. This ICD code is then used by medical laboratories to identify tests that must be performed to confirm the diagnosis. The ICD code is used by the healthcare management system to verify that all treatments and laboratory work performed are appropriate for the given virus. Medical coders use ICD codes to assign the proper code for procedures performed, and medical billers, in turn, use this information to process claims for reimbursement by insurance companies. Vital records keepers use ICD codes to record cause of death on death certificates. Epidemiologists use ICD codes to calculate morbidity and mortality statistics. Clinical focus part two. 
David's doctor was concerned that his symptoms included prickling and itching at the site of the dog bite. These sensations could be early symptoms of rabies. Several tests are available to diagnose rabies in live patients, but no single antemortem test is adequate. The doctor decided to take samples of David's blood, saliva, and skin for testing. The skin sample was taken from the nape of the neck, posterior side of the neck near the hairline. It was about 6 millimeters long and contained at least 10 hair follicles, including the superficial cutaneous nerve. An immunofluorescent staining technique was used on the skin biopsy specimen to detect rabies antibodies in the cutaneous nerves at the base of the hair follicles. A test was also performed on a serum sample from David's blood to determine whether any antibodies from the rabies virus had been produced. Meanwhile, the saliva sample was used for reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction, RT-PCR analysis, a test that can detect the presence of viral nucleic acids, RNA. The blood tests came back positive for the presence of rabies virus antigen, promoting David's doctor to prescribe prophylactic treatment. David is given a series of intramuscular injections of human rabies immunoglobulin along with a series of rabies vaccines. Why does the immunofluorescent technique look for rabies antibodies rather than the rabies virus itself? If David has contracted rabies, what is his prognosis? That brings us to the end of Section 1. Join me next time for Section 2, The Viral Life Cycle. Until then...